Everyone who is paying attention to the aerospace and military news will have heard the recent scandal about British pilots in Chinese service, or better, serving as consultants for the Chinese Air Force. This event gave me the idea of revisiting the Chinese Air Force training. It is a subject that we have already covered in the past and you will see a long format of the two previous videos at the end of this one. But first, let's speak of what has happened. So apparently up to 30 British pilots have been hired by the Chinese Air Force as consultants. They were supposed to help the Chinese understand the Western tactics. Apparently the pilots didn't break any law, but uh, the British government is quickly moving in uh, setting up a, a legislation that is going to forbid this to happen in the future. These pilots in fact were all retired pilots with experience on high performance jets. They were offered a good salary for their job, so they became consultants for the Chinese Air Force. They were not instructors, as someone said, they were consultants, so they were providing know-how. They were not training the Chinese pilots directly. And the British have not been the only one. There is at least one pilot from the US Marines that accepted a similar job, and we know of French naval pilots from the French Navy consulting for the Chinese Navy about carrier operations. Plus, there are non-confirmed rumors of Canadian pilots uh, doing the same thing. One point that all the parts involved wanted to make immediately clear is that so far no pilot trained on fifth generation jets, that is the F-22 or the F-35, has been hired by Chinese. And this is obviously important because otherwise they would be giving away the crown jewels of Western Air Forces. Some commentators said that this is basically no big deal, in the sense that the Chinese have their own tactics, which are centralized tactics, very different from the Western ones. So those consultants, uh, the only thing they could have done was basically brief the Chinese about how the Western Air Forces are organized and how they fight, but they would not be useful to improve the capabilities of the Chinese Air Force. I personally beg to defer. The Chinese are well aware that that kind of tactics are no longer adequate in the modern environment, but for them is more than a yeah, training or tactical evolution is a cultural change. We have indeed reports of exercises modeled pretty much on what the Western Air Forces do, where they simulate a scenario and the pilots have some freedom of uh, deciding their own tactics and uh, their own operations. There are less and less scripted exercises and pilots are less and less forced to follow the centralized command from a ground or a, an airborne controller. And I also have to record an increased openness about the challenges and the problems that their Air Force is facing. There have been high-ranking Chinese officers in the Air Force or the Navy explaining that there were shortcomings indeed and the, their training, their preparation was not yet completely adequate to the modern combat environment. Also, the investments in pilot training are not showing any sign of slowing down. Quite the contrary, Chinese flight schools and academies are receiving more and more modern combat aircraft. We have seen some time ago the J-10. More recently, we have seen the J-11 being assigned directly to the schools to train the pilots directly on the aircraft. They are trying to shorten the syllabus, but they are also trying to improve uh, the pilot training beyond what was traditionally done in China. And all of this is actually coherent with the Chinese approach that has become quite clear in the last few years. The Russians have always tried to be asymmetric. The Chinese are actually up front. They are trying to match the Western capabilities, catching up with their own people, their own training, and their own hardware. Obviously, it's difficult to assess the progress that they are making because they hardly train with Western organized air forces. The closest thing that they do is training with the Thai Air Force, which 
using the grip pens often comes up on top. The impression, and this is my speculation, the impression that I have is that the Chinese pilot, as per today, are greener when they come out from the academies than corresponding Western pilots, but they catch up quickly. So an expert Chinese pilot is probably as proficient as a Western pilot, as a NATO standard pilot, when it comes to managing the aircraft and the weapons. However, it seems that there is still a gap, and some would say it is still quite wide, in terms of tactics and capability of managing the battle space. Anyway, I think that Chinese Air Force training is an important subject to understand Chinese proficiency. I will keep an eye on it. And now, on to the long format. Now, here's some news. The best aircraft is the aircraft with the best pilot. Period. So when we analyze the Chinese Air Force, we can't overlook training and doctrine. Otherwise, we are missing the key piece of information. Like everything else in China, pilot's training syllabus is quickly evolving. And the Chinese are also quickly evolving their tactical and operational doctrine. But let's start from the beginning. A Chinese person may join the PLAF because it has been recruited at school or because being enlisted, he then applied for the position. In fact, the potential cadet is probably coming from a school where he or she was already noticed as a good prospect. However, in the last few years, the Chinese are also accepting college and university students. In the same way, the Chinese Air Force used to be a predominantly Han force, but now is also accepting people coming from Chinese minorities. Between 1,000 and 1,300 cadets are recruited every year, and about 50% of them reaches the end of the training. The Chinese system is referred to as the four-stage system, and it is also called the 4 plus 1 plus 1, referring to the number of years that are actually required to complete the syllabus. The training starts with four years of academic formation at the PLAF University in Changchun. During these years, the cadet starts almost immediately flying with the simulators, but the real flight has to wait the fourth year with piston engine trainers, and it's going to last for about 250 hours. After university, the cadet is transferred to one of the three colleges, for one or two years. Combat pilots fly on the JL-8 trainer, while bomber and transport pilots use different aircraft and obviously helicopter pilots fly on helicopters. The flight duration in this stage is from 150 to 200 hours. In the following phase, lasting about one year, the pilot receives flight training and tactical training on his or her final operational aircraft. It is in this stage that a pilot may be selected to become a rear seat weapons control officer, basically the equivalent of the weapon system officers in Western Air Forces. At the end of this phase, the cadet becomes a third grade pilot. In phase four, lasting six months, the pilot receives further tactical training and crucially joint operations training. At the end of this stage, the pilot is finally assigned to the first operational unit. The Chinese doctrine has been for a long time even more rigid than the Soviet. Pilots were expected to closely follow a flight plan. They were expected to fire against the targets they were ordered to, when they were ordered to, with the weapons they were ordered to, by the ground controllers. This approach has proven several times to be ineffective and to be basically a waste of resources. In the late 90s and early 2000s, the entire Chinese military doctrine was subject to a revision. The focus shifted from a defensive, generalized popular war to limited regional conflicts and limited power projections beyond the country borders. But this wasn't easy. This was actually a rough ride. Even 
the display of technology of the Gulf War in 1991 didn't seem to cause an immediate and radical shift. Please remember that the PLAF is a branch of the army, so while the value of attacking ground targets from the air was actually accepted, air combat and air superiority were a sort of an afterthought. The Chinese Air Force has been for a very long time just a support service. For most of the 90s, the most advanced training and doctrine institution of the PLAF was the Flight Test and Training Center in Kanzu. This unit main task was to test aircraft, uh, weapons integration, uh, flight envelopes to extract the best from what was available. There was a very limited work going on on tactics or training. There were no particular studies either to improve the tactics or provide any form of realistic training. However, following the Western example, some experiments toward the end of the decade started using some units as aggressors. At the beginning, they simulated Russian tactics, they were just more familiar with those, but then they moved on and they started simulating the Korean Air Force tactics or, in general, Western Air Force tactics. The key enabler for this change was an agreement with Russia to use the infrastructures available at Lipetsk Air Base. Lipetsk is the Russian equivalent of Nellis Air Force Base and quite curiously the activities that are going on there go under the name of Red Flag as well. It would be interesting to know which one was the original, to be honest. In 1999, a new structure was created at Ding Sing, always under the name of Test and Training Center. Its original purpose was to test and evaluate the proposals that were coming from Kanzu or from the grassroots, from the operational units. Accepting proposals from the grassroots may seem strange, but to their credit, they effectively introduced a process for that. If the proposals were found useful and effective, they used to be formalized in manuals for the pilots, and the pilots were expected to learn and memorize every detail. But the real novelty about Ding Sin was that all these activities were conducted in a high-technology environment that was inspired by the American red flag. So Chinese units started to go to Ding Sing, do their training, do their tests, do their activities, and the first results were a disaster. It became painfully clear that even against a Russian simulated opposition, the current tactics were totally inadequate. And furthermore, it became clear that there was a large disparity of training and quality of the pilots within the PLAF itself. So something radical had to be done. There is a fundamental difference between Russia and China when it comes to strategic thinking. Russia has embraced asymmetry as its doctrine of choice to respond to potential challenges. The Chinese armed forces, and the PLAF in particular, have adopted a different strategy of matching the West, playing the same game, but with different hardware. So it is no wonder that a lot of Chinese hardware resembles the Western equivalents, but they are not copies, they are replicas. And they are replicas because they are built to fit into similar concepts. And among the things that the Chinese started to replicate, well, there was a red flag. In fact, in the 21st century, the quality of training has been constantly improving. Dingxing Base has grown in size and the technology has improved in parallel with the incredibly quick and large Chinese development. Since 2005, regular exercises take place at Dingxing. They're called the Red Sword and they happen in a challenging environment with high technology and a lot of data that can be analyzed after the fact. The size of Red Sword grew steadily from 20 aircraft at the beginning to about 100 
today. And in this the case, there have been visible improvement. New tactics have been introduced, and even a Red Sword uh, became uh, focused on air-to-ground operation, and Blue Sword was introduced for air combat and air superiority. Also, the Golden Helmet competition was created to give the pilots the possibility of showing their capabilities in a free-form context. The analyst's opinion is that the Chinese have really moved away from their inflexible tactics and changed deeply. Then, Falcon Strike 2015 happened. The Chinese have been training with foreign air forces for some time. The cooperation with Russia was very important and still ongoing. From 2011, there is also a regular cooperation with Pakistan. There have been contacts with Turkey and so on. But in 2015, they went to Thailand for an exercise with the Royal Thai Air Force called Falcon Strike. Falcon Strike was a pretty realistic and unscripted war game where the Chinese J-11s clashed with the Thai Gripens. The first two days of the exercise were dedicated to within visual range engagements. This is the weak spot of the Gripen, but one of the strong points of the J-11, like all the members of the flanker family. During these two days, the Chinese won most of the engagements with a resounding 25 to 1. Then, the exercise moved on to the main event. The two forces fought a simulated, unscripted air campaign where each party was allowed to use their weapons and their tactics freely, with no particular limitations as they would do in a real conflict. And then, everything changed. In the following four days, the Thai Gripens shot down 41 J-11s for the loss of only three of their own. The Chinese took a while to elaborate the loss, but it seems to have been a healthy cold shower. In fact, in recent years, a few Chinese analyses have emerged and they were pointing the finger not at the aircraft, not at the weapons, not at the technology, but at the pilot's training. The Chinese pilots did not pay enough attention to the environment around them lack of situational awareness. They reacted very predictably to the threats. They were quite poor at evading missiles. They lacked coordination and they were easy to lure into a trap. Since then, in various public occasions, PLAF commanders have stated how tactics and training are the new focus of the service. Since then, the cooperation with other air forces has become even closer. Now we are in 2021, we don't know the situation, but we may expect that they sort of learn the lesson. I don't like this, sir. I'm sorry, Otis. It's for your own good. I didn't do anything wrong, sir. Otis, you shipped yourself to China without telling anything to me or to anyone else. You shipped yourself to a Chinese pilot academy and after having met with your friends, just you just decided like that you wanted to have a look up close to the JL-10s and the J-10s, so you started wandering series. in the hangars. You end up messing up with the graduation ceremony, you have okay, been spotted and you don't realize how difficult it was to convince the Chinese to send you back. You'd have no idea how difficult it was to actually write a script that selectively deleted all your memories from that you place with without memory, damaging sir. you and convince the Chinese that it actually worked. If it didn't manage to do that, you could have been scrap metal by now. Aww. Sorry, Otis. It's for your own good. I'm sorry. It is dark in here. Oh, come on, you have infrared. <laughs> I also have the name and the number of the lady you meet at the supermarket. She is single. Okay, I'm listening. <laughs> This video is a follow-up of the previous video about Chinese training and doctrine. Why do we need to follow up? Well, because recently there has been quite a large change that has probably few equivalents in the West.
China operates a large fleet of trainer aircraft and the most numerous of those is the JL-8, which is roughly an equivalent of the British Oak or the Italian MB-339. After that, the pilots transition on the JL-9, which is a supersonic trainer roughly equivalent to the T-38 Talon. But currently, there is also an advanced trainer, the JL-10, that is being deployed as we speak. This one is roughly an equivalent of the Italian Mach 346 Master or the Russian Yak-130. China is currently focusing on improving pilots' training in several ways, but in 2021 there have been some important upgrades to this syllabus. In August 2021, the first group of cadets trained only on JL-10 actually graduated from Shazhuang Academy. This class skipped the JL-9 stage and part of the JL-8 training thanks to these peculiar JL-10 features. In fact, the JL-10 is designed to simulate the flight characteristics and the cockpit and, let's say, the general experience of a four-generation fighter. In this way, the pilots that are destined to the J-10 or one of the flanker variants or the J-20 are better prepared to transition to their final aircraft. The Chinese have reported the 30% improvement in the learning speed with no detrimental consequences. Uh, yes, you read correctly, this is not a mistake. During 2021, the Shazhuang Academy received an undetermined number of J-10s. Yes, J-10s. The J-10 is basically the cornerstone of the Chinese Air Force. It is a multi-role fighter, it is the most numerous type in service, and it has three variants. Apparently, the aircraft destined to the Academy are J-10As, the oldest variant. We have a series of videos about the aircraft, link above here if you're interested. So the purpose of the J-10 is to train the cadets on their final aircraft directly at Academy level. In this way, the whole process of training a cadet is reduced from six years to little more than four years. So the new cadets start flying early on basic trainer aircraft, then they skip the JL-8, go directly to the JL-10, where they get their jet experience. In their fourth year, the cadets start flying the J-10 and they learn to fly the aircraft in those tactical and joint operations that are fundamental to become a combat-ready pilot. In this way, as we have already pointed out, the entire syllabus has been reduced of almost two years without compromising the quality of the cadets graduating from the academy according to the Chinese. Not all the pilots follow this accelerated training uh, because the limiting factor is the availability of frontline combat fighters to be assigned to the academies. We have no news of any other combat aircraft assigned to the academies, so for now we have to think that flanker pilots and J-20 pilots are following the normal syllabus. These changes in Chinese training stimulate at least a couple of considerations. The Chinese Air Force is focusing heavily on training, finally recognizing that it is a fundamental enabler of an Air Force effectiveness. And mind that this is a realization that if we consider what used to be the PLAF doctrine back in the 80s or even early 90s, it is no small achievement. In the early 2000s, the Chinese Air Force suffered some failures in joint training with other countries that have been basically attributed to training and doctrine. Those have been hard lessons, but it seems that the Chinese have actually learned quite well from those. The second consideration is that the Chinese seem to have a real hunger of pilots. 
and this is the reason why they are accelerating their formation. The most likely underlying reason is that they're planning a further expansion of the Air Force. And this would not be exactly news because they have been consistently acquiring about 100 combat aircraft every year, either replacing the older uh, models or creating new units. However, it is possible that the Chinese are thinking to operate their aircraft with a blue-gold model. That is, having one aircraft for more than one pilot, so the aircraft can fly more missions than the pilots. In fact, in wartime, at least for a limited period, the aircraft can definitely fly more missions than a pilot. However, these are speculations and we don't know the exact answer. But we will keep following the development of the situation. In the meanwhile, we have quite a few videos about China on the channel and they are going to appear beside me. Thank you very much for watching and see you there.